So hopefully it's not me and you watching ourselves. It that could be. be. It could be. <laughs> so uh, to anyone who's probably not us, uh, welcome to uh, my weekly Twitch stream. Uh, my name is Mark Mendel, and today I'm joined by Robert Bailey. Hello, Robert. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> oh, it's really weird. I'm watching myself on Twitch, and there's like this long delay. Yeah, and you're blue. I don't know why you're blue, but you're there. No, it could just be the light in this tiny little room I'm in. It, it's gonna be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. Everything will be fine. I'm going to move that off my screen. All right, cool. All right, so you wanted to talk to me about how I do um, like the, all the development stuff. Yeah, in particular, how you set your IDE up. Because I'm, you know, have, have for a long time just used sort of VI and command line tools yep. to, to do Go stuff. And I've, I've got this fancy new IDE. Uh, and it's, you know, doing stuff. And I edit files in it. But I'm not, like, using it to do builds or run tests or... Uh, anything sort of fancy, right? Okay. So I'd like to get it set up so it's fancy and not just you know, a prettier <laughs> version of AI, right? Oh, you want the fancy version is basically... Oh, fancy. That's the whole point of an idea, You want right? the it's fancy version. Fancy. All right, sweet. So why don't we switch over to screencasting? You'll be in the bottom right-hand corner and I can be in the top right-hand corner. Awesome. Um, so yeah, this is my IDE. Uh, it looks like IntelliJ. I think you're using Goland, right? Or you were playing with Goland. Yes, yeah, I've got Goland installed. I got a license for it and everything. Got it. So um, I, use, I use IntelliJ with the plugin because I think I've just customized this a whole bunch in a, in a wide variety, so I'm just very used to it. Uh, but Goland's great too, so that's fine too. Um, where would you like to start? Well, so I guess the first question. So I originally, you know, cloned the repo into my Go path. Yep. And then, you know, I saw the PR go by that switched to Go modules. So I yep. immediately like abandoned that and like reset like a new project under just like a random directory that I created to like yep. verify the Go modules work. Looks like from your path at the top that yours is maybe still in your go path, or maybe you just have a path that looks like a go path there at the top. You ask a really good question. I set this up a long time ago, so why don't we go have a look? Uh, so if we pop into our settings, because that was my, my first question. Is I don't know if that influences how well the IDE can like index everything. That like is how, true. How go modules aware is it versus just like being um, sort of back in the go path? So I think the good thing about this from memory is that it doesn't necessarily look at, uh, all right, so my go root, I actually have a version of go in a dot go folder. I actually copy it straight out of the Linux, um, out of the Docker image, because I can, because I run Linux on both my things, but that's fine. That's my go version. And then go path. I do have a project go path set up. Okay. I don't have that. Now I don't have that set up. Um, I think is a, that's not my go path on my system. In fact, I don't even think I have a go path set up on my system, but I do have that set up there. Uh, I probably did that way before we started using um, the dependency tools, but if everything's um, like clickable and you can like go to everything, then it probably doesn't matter. Yeah, I can definitely like jump to definitions and stuff. Yeah. That part seems to be working. Yeah, uh, so I occasionally get errors like it won't index boring SSL because it takes more than 20 minutes. Oh, fun. I don't even know what that does. Um, yeah, so outside of that, I, I mean, I probably did it ages ago, so I've never changed it and it seems to be fine. But as long as you can, like, I don't know, pick a random thing, for example. Like, uh, that doesn't help. Okay. That one doesn't have anything in it. Yeah. It doesn't have anything in it. If I can click, like, scheduling strategy or pact or whatever. Uh, you know, I can I can do all that kind of stuff where I can, you know, maybe I'm like, oh, you know, where has that been used? And I can search for all usages and all that kind of stuff. Then like everything works. Cool. Yeah, find usages. I'll just replicate that. No usages found. Did you get no usages found of that one? No, I got lots. Hmm. Interesting. Find options. Scope all places. Find. Yeah, it's telling me there are no usages. That's interesting. So maybe my path is not set up correctly. Maybe not. Uh, if we're gonna, there we go. So find usages. I have that set as Control G, for example. I was just right clicking on it and saying find usages, which yeah. apparently is also Option F7, which is going to be a really hard key combination to hit. There you go. Can you, if I right click, can you see that window? No. Okay. So Hangouts no. is not sharing that with you. So you'll see that on the Twitch stream. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yay, Hangouts. Yeah, my computer is also just like, oh my God, you're running Hangouts and it's your stream all at once. Okay, fun. Cool. Uh, so you might want to try setting that uh, go path. Um, that might work a little better for you. 
Okay, so I've got a go root, and I've got yeah. So my go path is, is set somewhere else on my system, right? That's ah. the global, global go path, right? Which it's probably finding for my environment. Very yeah, close. which I so if I actually pop up in a terminal, um, in print, in print, in print, in print, in print. I don't think I have one. Oh, I do actually have one. I have a go path set locally. Oh, I wonder if that's set from IntelliJ. IntelliJ foresight go path. If I have a look locally, which you can't see, uh, print and grep, grep path. Okay, so uh, if you look on the Twitch stream, uh, if I run that in like a normal shell, go path doesn't show up. But if I run it from the shell inside IntelliJ, it does, which is actually a really interesting trick. I did not know that. Right, because you've got it set in your IntelliJ preferences, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So since I since I have mine in a random directory, like a go path is not actually going to make much sense, because like, I don't have like the the source and the bin and all those sort of folders. Right. Defined. Yeah. Whereas if I look in mine, like um, you can see that there, I have source there, uh, a couple of other little things, and there's a Ghanes dev, and then that Ghanes. So in theory, because we're using Go modules, it probably shouldn't matter. But I don't know if IntelliJ understands that yet okay i just found under the ghost preferences if you go below go path there's one that says go modules and there's a checkbox that says enable Ooh. go modules integration so i'm going to click that and see what happens error writing go mod sweet permission denied i do not have that as an option uh do you see my you see my thing on hangouts or no still no which thing Sorry. so i've opened the settings window now I cannot see anything except the back window on Hangouts, which is a little frustrating. That is annoying. I can see down the Twitch stream. So yeah, I don't see any setting for Go modules in there. It's right there, like four down under Dep. <clears throat> under Dep. To go because Go oh, path, oh, tags, oh, depth, that thing. Go got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Oh, so apparently I have that on as well, and I have vendoring mode on as well. Um, I tend to use the command line when I do my the the updates of with with modules anyway, so I don't know. That's actually an interesting question. Vendoring mode. Okay, let's try that. Let's see if that gives me an error. Oh, look at that! Find usages now. Finds a bunch of stuff. Cool. Ah, cool. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. You were asking if that worked. I thought it did. Clearly, it didn't. Uh, some of the searches worked. I'm not sure why some worked and others didn't. Uh, like going to definitions of things seems to have been working. Yep. Um, but maybe find usages because it's searching in the opposite direction was not was not, not working. Properly. Not as indexed properly. Interesting. Interesting. So yeah, that uh, that all seems pretty good. Uh, what else? What, yeah. Where, where else do you want to go? Okay. So like, I always just do like. I've got a terminal open in the background. I'd say, you know, make build, make test. Yep. And you were saying that oftentimes you'll run individual tests through the IDE. Yep. So what does that look like? So, um, so if we look at like unit tests, are probably the the classic example. Uh, let's just go package. Doesn't really. Where was I working on today? I was looking at. I was probably looking at something. Uh, SDK server test, for example. So if I want to run, uh, there's actually a couple of interesting things here, some of which are handier than others. Um, so if I want to run uh, any, any even test, so I can just go boom, right click that, run test, and it'll run the individual test. Or I can run, here we go, let's see how, how it compiles while I'm, okay. while I'm running a Hangout plus Twitch stream all at the same time. Which is fantastic. So it'll run uh, an individual test, and it'll do exactly the same thing as you would expect it to when it's actually done. There we go. Test pass. Beautiful. Uh, if I wanted to, I can actually right-click on the file, click run, run the whole file. Um, there are a couple of shortcut keys. I don't know what they like. You can actually bring up um, if I want to run individual tests, like run the test I'm in, uh, that kind of stuff, which is super nice. Um, and then like rerun the test and that kind of stuff. Um, all, all my IntelliJ key bindings are like ridiculously annoyingly custom because it's just what I've used and used to for the last five years. But the one thing that it does do, which I really like, and I'll see if I can find an example. Um, let's see if I can find an example. T.run. Here we go. That'll do the job. 
Um, actually, I don't want that one because it's a big one. But um, if you can go, um, which I'm sure you are quite familiar with already. Uh, give me a, give me, no, give me, yeah, one of these. Um, within a test, you can have like a subtest where you can specify a name and then the, the test is a function. Yep. If it's in IntelliJ or Goland as a T, like a straight up t.run like constant, not a dynamic one, you can actually run that individual test uh, from the command line, which is also super nice. Open that up. Are you in the the, the fleet? Oh, I guess which controller are you? In? I'm in one of them. Uh, <laughs> game servers. Game servers. Usually, I get a nice thing across the top. Um, it's taking a little while to compile. So this this is this can be super nice um, if you just want to run one of the individual tests, or for example, um, like you can see, it'll actually show all the different types of ones. So maybe if I would just run entire thing we'll get like four or five down here maybe one of them fails the other one doesn't i can choose which one it is that i want um and then it can run the individual one okay cool um all right cool yeah i, I just ran one of the the creating a game server t dot runs and that, yeah. that passed and by the same token if you want to do debugging like step debugging or any of that kind of stuff um within here and you want to run that individual test with the step debugger that's also super useful I've got, I actually got, I really kind of funny. I remember when I first got into doing step debugging, right? When I was using Java and like university and I was like, this is way too hard to set up. I'm never going to do this. And now that I'm back writing go, like it's actually so easy to do that. I do it all the time. <laughs> Maybe, you know, for the edification of myself and anybody who want, might want to watch this later, oh, yeah. break, break a test and step through and, and yeah. Or show we'll us how that works in ID. Uh, I'll just, I'll set a breakpoint. Like I'll pick a point wherever I want to do it. Um, and then we'll just say, this is going to take a while to compile. I'll go, what I did was I just right click and said, debug this particular test. Okay. So it's going to compile it as a debug version. Chug along, chug along, chug along. There we go. Actually, that's pretty good. So, um, so it, it is stopped at this particular breakpoint here, and we can start to look at uh, basically everything that's inside here. Uh, so we have this fixture; it's one of our objects. It's a it's our our uh, game server object that we had specify up here. Yeah, um, that's, that's what it's going to be marshaled, right? So you can look at it yeah. before it gets marshaled, basically. Yeah, and then we can control our flow as we go through. So I'm going to step over this. I don't want to go into it. Um, and so what if we see what we've got? So what's our raw data here? Right, so now you can see both the variable and what it looks like when it's marshaled. Which at the moment is, oh, look at that. Yeah, IntelliJ has some nice stuff in there because that's a byte array. It actually converted it into a string so we can have a look at it. Yes, so, unless you really want to try to read read the bytes. No, which I don't. <laughs> that would be terrible. Uh, we can keep stepping through uh, and then say like, okay, maybe we get to this function and we're like, okay, this is, this is something we actually want to see what's going on. Let's step into that and then it'll go into that function and we can start, we can start poking around inside there as well. Nice. Which is super nice. Cool. So when you, I guess the, the thing this is not going to necessarily help you with is trying to, to debug flakiness and, and race conditions as much unless you get really lucky when you hit your breakpoint and yep. you, you can see where the, the problem is. That's um, true. But if, but if there's a consistently failing test and this is a really nice way to like dive in and Look at the variables as you're debugging it. Yes, but uh, you brought up race conditions. Mm, this is also yes. an interesting thing. So uh, within our make file, if we actually look at, I want to say test.co. I think a lot of people who write, oh, that didn't help. Oh, um, there is a make file plugin for IntelliJ. It's super nice. Um, it does a half decent, a pretty decent job. Um, there goes my dog barking and stuff. This is layers deep at this point. Um, is it up here? If go test, where is that specified? Here we go. Okay, I'll go test command. Oh my God. How many layers do we have to this thing? Race detector arcs. Oh my God. Okay, so this is layers deep. But if you attach dash race to go test, um, it will uh, do race condition detection, uh, which is really nice. Um, so if you're trying to access a variable at the same time in different like go routines or something like that. So what I actually do inside my execute configurations, 
uh, inside templates, which is your default versions of like all the execution things you can do inside IntelliJ. If I look down and go test, I set dash race in my goal tools argument. So even if I'm running an individual test from my IDE or a big bunch of tests, I always get race condition testing, which is uh, super, that is super nice. Does that, does that run the test more than once looking for race conditions or does that just run it like with sort of out of order stuff, trying to make it more obvious when stuff goes wrong? So if I actually understand it, what it actually does is it looks for concurrent access for variables that aren't either like mutex locks or run through a channel or that kind of stuff. And it goes data race and you get a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, interesting. Cool. It's actually, I found it been very, really, really, really useful. So, um, so if you're doing like development on Go or take Organize itself and you don't want to wait to get race condition checking until you get to the very end and you run the full test suite, um, that can be a really nice default argument. Cool. I'll have to see if I can figure out where that is. And uh, So if you go up the top, there's uh, a yeah, edit configurations and then inside templates. Yeah, since I'm using Goland, it might, I feel like it's in a different, different place. Editor, plugins, build, execution, deployment. So I don't think it's in settings. It's oh, usually, it's settings, though, yeah, sorry. it's usually right up by the uh, by the run debug, all these settings, all these doohickeys up here. Okay. And mm -hmm. then you'll see, uh, like, there's a little drop down and it says edit configurations. Which is fun. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. Right. Unlike the name of the file. Interesting. Okay, yeah. so it's under under templates then. Go test. Go tool arguments. Yes. Now, Authros asked me an interesting question. What was that? I'm looking at the chat room. I like the gray annotations of variables on the right for your custom step. Yep. Uh, you don't have to do anything special to get that. It comes built in with the Go test project. Yeah. Yeah. You don't do anything special. They just they just show up. Which is which is a good question. Uh, but I don't think I saw those. Where the I think, I, I think I know what he's talking about. I think in here, if I get this right. Oh, like the parameter names? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so it says it knows it's invalid game server. It knows it knows what it's called. Where it does fall over um, is if you're doing, like say in, um, so yeah, you can see like what step it's on. And I assume that's, I assume that's what you're talking about. Orthros. If I'm spanking that right, uh, where it does fall over a little bit is like, for example, is it this one? No, it's not this one. Um, so you do like table driven testing. So like you have a big data structure. Usually I use the key value uh, from a map as the name of the test. And then, so like t.run with the, the key name, um, which is nice because then they come out in random order and they're not a set order and, and then things happen that way. Uh, but I can't, I can't like click it. <laughs> there's no, there's no clicking it here, uh, which is actually, so one thing I wish they would actually do, because if you ran, run the test, um, it gives you all the breakdown, which is nice. Um, if you go back to the command line, you can actually specify on the command line to run it as one individual test. Um, like you can see they're all broken down here, but I can't, I can't like right click it and like rerun that individual one, even though that is an option filterable from the command line. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, because that's that's one of sort of the Go idioms is the table driven tests. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it sounds like to make that play nice with the IDE, you can you have to sort of almost do it in line with the t.runs instead of as a table ahead of time. Yeah, either do the t.run or or I mean it's I mean this is this is not terrible. Um, or I've been known to do stuff where I cheat a little and I'll be like if k does not equal you know <laughs> reserved, you right. know, and then I'll be like t dot skip now, you know, and then. Then I'm like I'm usually like I write a then little just one. to do yep. you know remove this thing, and that's that's a thing. That's a that's a, that's an a, a, a habit that I picked up where I have a special type of to do, which is the to dos that I need to do before I submit the commit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have I have a filter in my to do like in my to do list, so I can it's specifically for toxos, so I know that. I can, I can, which basically means what I can do is I can sit down for an hour, do some concentrated thinking, and then I can do the rest of the work in front of my TV. <laughs> uh, interesting. 
does it does it it's like a pre-submit hook where it's like prevents you from sending a pull request with that in there or so that there would be question? that would be a really smart thing of doing i don't have that actually i should do that that would actually be really nice uh right now i just kind of manually i just i just run that and have a look uh, kind of grab, grab over the files for yeah it. well it shows up so inside to do itself i have this filter called show all and do it xos uh i see what you're saying yeah okay. so i just added that Which, in there yeah so it's the IDE's version of grepping over all your files. Yeah, yeah, it has that it has that as a to do thing because otherwise you just get everyone's to dos and then I'm like, oh, I can't I can't track that. Interesting. Is there so you presume you could do a, a filter for also like to do parentheses Mark Mandel close parentheses? Yeah, right? that I could do like that too. Ones, ones assigned to you. Uh, what's it in here? That would also work, but that seems like a lot of writing. Well, but then I could check them in and assign them to you, and then you'd find them. That is I true. That is true. I could do that. So inside the set, in the inside the editor, uh, you can set up your own, um, basically regexes for whatever you want to call them, and then have filters for them as well and stuff. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. That's a that's a trick I like. But uh, you were talking about testing, and so the other thing. Um, so this particularly works when you're running your tests on GKE because especially for particular, um, like all your IPs for like your nodes are going to stay the same. This this can be a bit trickier sometimes on like Minikube or if you're running locally. But um, so we'll see if this actually this, this test. I can't remember what I don't know what I have on my test cluster right now. But I, because these are Go tests, I can run them from my machine as well. And because my cube configs in the same spot as is expected to be in, I actually can just run these as tests. Okay, and so pre prepare steps you have to do before that will actually work is is run the make target to create your test cluster. Yes. And then and then set up your cube config. And is it just reading the the system cube config? Yeah. Like from your home directory. Okay. Yeah, because client go will go look there anyway. Um, oops, so much stuff broken. Um, I don't even know what I have on my. Uh, I don't have. I don't even know what I have up there. <laughs> I don't remember which version I have up there, but that's fine. But as you can see, I can run it and it fails or it works. Um, nice. Uh, so the tooling, like the Docker tooling that we have for Agones, puts your cube config in the the normal cube cube config version spot. Um, so so it looks there by default anyway. So it actually works super super nice, which is really nice. Uh, cool. What else do you want to look at? What other fun stuff we got? All right. So let's see. So that's that's sort of the uh, the big parts of the the primary workflow, which is like. Editing code, jumping around, yep. running some small tests. Now we're talking about running some slightly bigger tests, setting up your cluster. Um, I don't know if I get the the nice make file integration because I don't have the full IDE. That's probably okay. So there is that is just a plugin. Uh, so if we look at our plugins, um, it came out actually. I think about I want to say last year at some point. Um, and it's the make file support. Yeah, I don't and know if that exists for oh, for GoLand though. Oh, that's sad. I see. Uh, plugins I've got Bash support, Kubernetes, and Protobuf support right now. If you search the marketplace, does it show up? Oh, I'm gonna see if it's bundled. It's possible that they just built it in. Uh, I don't see it there. It may well be in the market. Do you have access to the marketplace? I assume so. Yeah, that's what I'm searching. The marketplace. Oh, there it is. Make file support. Cool. Install. Um, what other plugins do I really, really like? Uh, bash support. Um, what have I got in here? Go, obviously. Uh, idea ASCII is very important so that you can make pretty ASCII titles. As you've seen all <laughs> over my make files, that's that's why. <laughs> Uh, is that where those come from? <laughs> That's where they come from. I don't know where I picked up that habit from, but I just did. Uh, there I is a... that might have been like a website where you went to and it generated for you. I think just that... right, right in the ID. Right in the ID. Yeah, very important. Uh, <laughs> there is a Kubernetes plugin that's not half bad. Um, it does have CRD support that I've sort of touched on. Um, do, 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 do. We have some plant UML diagrams, and so the integration in that is actually quite nice. I have uh, uh, the Markdown one installed, which is kind of cool because when you pull up the Markdown file, yeah. it'll split, split screen your ID and show you the render, which is awesome. Yeah, uh, do. it doesn't work great with like the little curly brace like feature release stuff that we do. Yeah, but it's better than nothing. Yes, I agree. It's definitely better than nothing. Um, oh, where do we want to go next? Uh, 
what's other fun things? Uh, Orthos is sad that you didn't do the ASCII art by hand. <laughs> I did not do the ASCII art by hand. Yeah, there we go. So there's, there's a good example right there. No, use a tool. That's what tools are for. Um, <laughs> actually, what a crubbly could look at. Um, let's just go to Max New. We'll flip that. So we jump into our corners itself. So we have Make Shell, which I think a lot of people have seen. Oh, my network is busted. So let me fix that. Stop doing that. It's all right. That'll come back in a sec. Do, 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 do. There it goes. Beautiful. All right. So this is where I'll normally do um, like QCTL get pods. I don't even know what I have on this cluster right now. Yeah, oh, apparently I have stuff up there running. Cool. Um, so, so make shell, it's, it's jumping into the shell inside the Docker container yes. where you did the build, right? Yes. Okay. And it mounts a, basically a bunch of stuff, including like the cube config and a particular spot that we store like our Google Cloud stuff. Uh, there's a, the Go mod cache. Um, but before you were saying for like the, the EDE tests work from your IDE, you had to have it set up on your local system, right? So couldn't you just run kubectl on your local system without running the shell first and get the same results? I could totally do that. Um, I have this weird behavior where I don't like installing tools locally. <laughs> okay. um, I like environments where I'm like, I know exactly everything I need for this thing. It's got like the right version. Like it's always going to be the right version of what it is that I want. So everything's in there. They're just the way I like it. Um, rather than having weirdness with like different versions and stuff like that. Maybe that's a little bit Docker overkill. I can own that. That's fine. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I like to do it. That's pretty small. For a long time, my system cube control was like 1.6 because in version 1.7, they broke something. That... Yep bothered me and I just never upgraded <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa I think I was talking to someone the other day and they were running like version 114 or 115 and they were like why is this thing not working I was like I don't know what happens if you downgrade and they did and it was like oh now it works I'm like hmm, cool interesting okay um, so I do like all my go imports you know if I'm like you know make sure a package is is, is set properly um, that kind of stuff I don't know why that's on an odd angle Interesting. All right. So like if you were going to update package dependencies, you would also do it from the shell and not on your local system then? Yeah. So if I'm going to update package dependencies, I would do it inside the Docker file so that I know that that Docker file has all the things as it should be, or I would pin them to certain versions if that's what's important to me, that kind of stuff. Right. Interesting. Okay. And not through the ID then, through the command line in the shell. Oh, uh, so when you say dependencies, like if I was going to do like go mod stuff? Yes. Yeah, like uh, yeah. What, what we used to do is go depths for, and now we're using go mod. Got so it. When you're run, running those commands, you're doing that in the shell and not on your local system. Then. Yeah, I usually do it in the shell. The downside of that being that everything that happens in the shell is owned by root, which means that I need to kind of go back and ch own stuff sometimes. Um, but I'm happy doing that, so that's that's fine. I don't even remember what the go mod commands are anymore. But yeah, I'll do go imports from there. I'll do go mod from there. I'll do all my kubectl stuff from there. Um, and then git, I will, you know, I'll do everything gitish over here in my local. Okay. And then things like like the the doc site and rendering and testing that. Do you do all of that on your local machine? Or do you do that through your IDE? Or do you do that? So we have make targets for that. So, uh, yeah, so for, I'm asking where you run those from. Like, do those run through your IDE or through your just the window? I just run them on the shell. So I'll run them from here. So I'll be like, uh, site server. Right. Eh. This is being annoying. I don't know why. Apparently running tmux inside the, the shell that's inside there. But yeah, so like I'll run that in there. And then I'll go open that up in a browser and go to localhost. Whatever, 1313. Oops. And then I can go see that here and, and do all that kind of stuff on there. Which you won't see on Hangouts, but you'll see on Twitch. Yeah, it's a little delayed. I'm looking yeah. for it. Okay. Um. Yeah, and the nice thing about Hugo is, as well, is whenever you make an update, it will reload the page. Like, so if you can edit stuff, I can edit stuff in a markdown file and it'll reload the page on Hugo. And so I can always, like, bounce back with some ports. Oh, that's nice. Okay. I did not realize um, that. I always just kill it and restart. It's the 
iteration cycles a bit slower that way. Yeah, so it'll it'll do that. Um, we do have some docs in here, which we should probably actually link to from the contributing experience about like running the site and like uh, how to run like the current website's version versus by default it runs the development version. Uh, some of the tools we use like Doxy, like links to Doxy, which is the actual theme that we use, and it's got some decent docs in there. Um, the link checker that we use and how to use that and like. What if you're, I think you ran into this the other day, like uh, what if you write docs and it's pointing to a link that doesn't exist yet because the PR hasn't been accepted. How do I yep. do that? And like, there's an attribute you can put on there and, and basically some tooling around that too. Um, oh, nice. I'll go look that up. Um, and like publish date and expiry date. So those are the feature, the, the feature, how you deal with, um, what's I going to say? So we, we try, we have it set up so that whenever you push to master, the docs get updated, which means that you could potentially write docs for features that aren't ready yet. So we have a bunch of ways of managing that at the page level and then within the page as well. So like the feature stuff you were talking about before. Uh, yes, and I, I noticed that that did not work in the YAML metadata for the page. And there are a couple other places where it doesn't quite work. Yeah. Some weird little edge cases. There are some weird edge cases. I've noticed if you wrap, um, actually you're not seeing it here because it's so big, but if you wrap uh, like a header section inside a feature shortcode, it won't show up on the right-hand side. I believe in later versions of Hugo that will that does work. They've fixed some markdown stuff in there. Um, and then, uh, but we haven't updated yet and I haven't worked. Usually, I mean, it's every six weeks, so it's like not a big deal. Yeah, the other one where other place people were mentioning on Slack the other day is that like the there's a Docker file that right now has you clone the master branch, which is currently yeah. not quite looking, right? And um, it's not clear to me what the right solution to that is. Because, yeah, like you said, in a couple of weeks it's going to be correct again, um, and it does sort of point out the how that skew can sometimes bite you. Yeah, it was this one here, which is the the allocator service example where yep. they get cloned from that. Yeah. It almost makes you wish that you could do like a git clone from latest release branch or something. We could probably do some bash trickery to. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. I was like, oh, all you have to do is git clone from the branch, but then I don't want to keep that up to date. So then I want to fetch the, the branch from somewhere canonical. Yeah. Clone from that. And I was like, oh, I, just, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole right now. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be fixed in two weeks, right? It'll be fixed in two weeks. Hey, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that's, that's what like Kubernetes does is like they go you know get kubernetes and it tells you the current release version and then you go fetch that as the next step right yeah um but that's yeah that's fine uh, the other the other option uh actually that still wouldn't work here too um yeah i don't know that one's fun okay so you mentioned you did do your all of your git stuff through the command line yeah when you're working on multiple branches at once um, does that change your workflow in the ID at all? Or are you pretty compartmentalized in terms of I'm working on this one, now I switch context, I'm working on this one? That's uh, Or do you do some like more back and forth? Do you branch on top of other branches? Like how do you do sort of stage Ooh. work? So that is, that is, I think there's a couple of fun things in there too. Um, so uh, so I, do use, I do use branches uh, to consolidate what I'm working on. Um, I don't know why that's, you know, I'm gonna exit a Tmux because it's driving me nuts. Um, uh, I use ZSH as a shell because I'm just like that way inclined. Uh, so you can see I have a bunch of old work here um, where feature features, like I kind of split them based on what sort of thing it is ish. Um, one thing I do like uh, in IntelliJ is I do use the task system quite a fair bit, which I quite like, which is uh, it tracks what files you're editing, what branch you're on. Um, and what changes you've made um, up to a task. So my default task is always attached to um, to master. But uh, for example, I've been working on this reverse, uh, um, reserve SDK stuff. Um, and we'll talk about that. So I can switch to that. That'll switch my, there it goes. It'll switch my branch, which will go down there in a minute. And as well as bring up all the files that I've been looking at since then. Uh, and then if I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that anymore, because usually I am working on a few different things because PRs take a while. Um, for small things, I'll just keep everything to the default task and then just manually switch different branches as I want to. Um, that's my that's sort of my, my, my dirty workspace, so to speak. But if I'm working on something a bit larger, um, then I, I, I will usually pull that into a, its own its own thing. So I can, there is, there is a nice, um, 
All right, so if I say like open task, for example, I will see if this works. Uh, no, so it doesn't. So there is a plugin, there's a GitHub plugin, uh, that's not too bad, that will actually list all your tickets in here too. For whatever reason, it doesn't like me right now. Um, I'm not gonna fiddle with credentials while I'm sitting on a stream. Um, wherein you can actually have a list of all your or your issues and your, uh, I think it just shows issues. It might show issues and PRs. And so you can create tasks based on that and then set up, um, so if I just create a new task, it's probably easier. And the same sort of thing. So if I'm like uh, streaming, do this thing, right? I can, I wanna create a change list that just tracks what's what's happening um, and like what, what files I'm in there and that kind of stuff. And then I can also tell it to um, create the branch at the same time or use a particular branch. And then I can click okay and it'll create a whole new context. I just created a whole new branch. I do that, I quite like that. Um, and that just lets me to context switch quite nicely. Um, you did ask an interesting question as well about like, how do I use branches? Um, one of the things that we're working with is like, particularly like Yarrick and some of the other people on the team have forced me to try and make smaller PRs, <laughs> which is a good thing. Like definitely absolutely a good thing. Um, so what I've been doing is like, I've been working on this re reserve SDK thing, which actually has a lot of components. So I've been writing these branches called complete slash, which is like all the work that I've been doing that I can just keep running forward with. Um, and then what I'll usually do is I'll take that. And if I'm like, oh, I think I have a chunk of work that I think is pretty decent. I'll go like this and then I'll go, where are we? Which you probably won't be able to see on here. So where's my Git stuff? Where is it? Oh, there we go. So I go down to Git and I'll do a compare with branch. I'll prepare that with say master. I'll probably create a new branch and then just look at all the changes and move them across as I need to within my IDE. Um, so I can start to I can start to pull out features as I need to based on what it is that I'm doing, run those tests, submit those for PR, and then just keep rebasing underneath as I go through. Interesting. Okay. So and you mentioned that your default task is on the master branch and you keep and that's like sort of your dirty workspace, which is interesting because most people I've talked to who use get they try to keep their master really clean oh that's true so i'll usually keep my default to master and then i'll be like oh cool uh i'm in master now let me uh get you know group and watch see like do this thing right i'll do that and then but it just takes me back to a default space that i know always exists because that's just easy yeah but i will i will create a branch for all the work that i do yeah, I don't have the, the tasks thing in GoLand that I can see. I've got the little the Git section with like the bar at the end after like the four uh. little icons and then no tasks. And I searched in settings for tasks and didn't see anything. So I wonder if that's uh, that's something I don't get with the, the slimmed down IDE. I wonder tools, startup tasks, tasks. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there. so inside I have the yeah, under tools, I have tasks. And you can actually have task servers. Oops, that's, oh, that's dead, so that's fine. You don't have to look at that. Um, apparently that API token is no good. Um, yeah, I have startup tasks, but not tasks. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so that's that's not something for me to be able to carry over. Then. That's all right. I've got my, I got my Git, Git workflow that I'm used to. And that's yep. Um, what are the uh, interesting things that I might do? Um, stuff. So when my my antiquated way of rebasing uh, is again sort of using VI. Uh, like I, I do my editing in GoLand, and then it's like, yep. oh, it's time to rebase. There's conflicts. Let me pull up my my old school editor and, and search for disk. Yeah. Um, do you do you find it pretty easy to do that in GoLand? So yeah, this has I, yeah this has really good Git conflict resolution. Um, that that's I do it all in here actually. I do that completely in here. So if I come across a conflict, if I'm doing like a rebase, uh, resolve conflicts is really nice, and it'll pop up. I can't show it here because I don't have a conflict, um, but it'll it'll pop up uh, the diff windows, and you can just do like apply all non non um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for like all the non-conflict stuff, and then you can go into conflicts. And sometimes uh, you'll even get a little wizard button where it's like, actually, I think I have a pretty good idea what, what you're trying to mush in together here, and it'll just okay. kind of take care of it. Um, so like my my classic flow would be like, I'm gonna say, get checkout minus B, like complete reserve SDK, and then, oops, sorry, my bad, checkout. GCO is just get checkout, and then I'll do get rebase master. Actually, did. Oh, there we go. We got a conflict. Perfect. Okay, cool. Um, actually, we'll go get rebase abort, get checkout master 
Right, so that's that's a common thing I'll do as well. So that's git checkout master and uh, git pull rebase and then git checkout the branch that I was just on. So I know that everything's up to date. And then I can git rebase master. Now we'll get a conflict. So now if we pop up here, bcs git, uh, where are we? Resolve conflicts. Gives me a list of all the conflicts that I have. Some of these I thought I fixed actually. Um, that's fine. Boom, pops that up. So I will apply that. All right, so this is, all right, so this is the stuff we were talking about before. I swore I did this the other day, just before. Oh, I know why, I know why, it's all right. Um, I'm like, I don't want that one. Okay, cool, that's great. Same thing, like, okay, we don't have any conflicting changes. Basically, we just want everything from the right on this one. This is just pulling in all the changes that you and I went through just recently. Yep. Uh, is that everything? Yep, that's everything. Apply, SDK server. There you go, I can just do some work while we're here. So that just applied everything that was non-conflicting, so I don't have to do that myself. Uh, get rid of that one. And um, the other thing is like, if I try to apply it now, it'll actually say, hey, I didn't I didn't do everything here. So uh, do you, do you, uh, no, I don't wanna save that, that's fine. Let's go down. It's quite nice. Down. Yeah, that's the one I want. All the way down. There we go. Yes. No. Actually, I think, can I? Oh, I could. No, I could grab everything from that. Okay, that's everything. Apply that. Here's my test. I think this actually has some more into it. Boop. Oop. But yeah, this is this is parts that I found have worked quite well for me. Okay. I'm just gonna finish this because I'm here. There we go, beautiful. So that's done. Um, get status. So now I can go to git rebase. Continue. Boof. Um, apparently there's some more, but we can do that later. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps going, yes. And so the, the branch you're rebasing right now is your master branch, right? No, so I'm rebasing the complete branch with all the work I had before. Oh, sorry. It's a, I saw default task on the top, which made me think master branch. Yeah, so actually, if you look in the bottom, you can actually see it says git rebasing complete reserve SDK. Um, there we go. Okay. I haven't managed to personally get... Oh, I can skip this. Um, yeah, it still hates me. Um, that's okay. We'll get there eventually. Um, I haven't managed to get the rebase inside the IDE to work the way I'd like. Um, okay. That's not that's not worked for me too well, but maybe other people have. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, you just I you know I just do that all in the command line. It's it's pretty comfortable. Yeah, but I find like this sort of view for for doing these kinds of things is way easier than trying to dig through files. That just drives me. This is just way too easy. Um, this doesn't have any magic wands. There's a few magic wands that show up on occasion. There you go, apply, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly. I think once you get used to it, it seems like it would definitely be a little bit faster than what I've been doing. Yeah, exactly. And, and there we go. Skip. Yay, and we're back. Let's push that up. Yeah, I use ZSH. I always, uh, always own my ZSH with with the Git plugin, and so I have all the commands in there as well. Um, in, in Bash, I have like Git completion. I assume that that's similar to yeah. Git plugins, where it'll it'll tab complete. Yeah, it'll tab complete, and uh, like GPF is Git push force with lease. Force with lease. That's what it is. Um, just to keep me a little bit safe with forcing my stuff. Um, hmm. What are different things? Do you use scratches, scratches and consoles? No. Scratches. Scratches are just little places where you can dump stuff you want to work on. Okay. Uh, you can do even like go files. Feel like I just need to be able to grab a snippet or. Uh, my common one is I will just use a scratch.md for when I'm going to do releases. <laughs> and then I just dump a bunch of stuff in it, update all the bits that need replacing, and then dump all in and then copy paste that into Git. I find that super 
super a super handy little uh, thing. Or I want I, classic example. I have a bunch of JSON I would like to format, please. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've not used that. What are the extensions for? Uh, the extensions. Oh, the, what their file type the is. Oh, is N. yeah. I don't know. Okay. I think I have some data. Oh, yeah. Genuinely, I don't know what that is. Maybe those are old. Yeah, no, no idea at all, actually. That is a good question. Um, here's a random thing. I do have a dot to do where I track all the things that I want to work on. <laughs> Did I is make... that in the git ignore? Or is yeah, it... that's why it starts with a dot. I, I definitely also have a habit of that is the first line that goes into every git ignore that I ever write. So that so that I can I can hide stuff easily. The same stuff that gets hidden in Linux gets hidden. But then of course I end up with a lot of these things. <laughs> yep. like, so, oh please, I didn't want to hide that one. Yeah, yeah. But it also I just find that nice where it's like if you ever if you ever want to personally hide something without like having to add it to get ignored, that's like specific to you. Like it's very easy to do to put a dot in front of it and it's hidden. <coughs> I might also lose it though. Cause it's like you said, it's hidden in the shell. So then you have to remember to like look for the dot stuff. But... Yeah. Which that's, yeah, that's fine. But it's here. It's here inside the editor and I know it's there and I, I do it a lot. So that, that works for me. 10 minutes left. Cause I know you have to run out of your meeting room. Um, I didn't have any other questions. Orthos also said he'd never heard of scratches. So that's uh, a, definitely a good thing. Do uh, I? What other? I'm trying to see that if was you... most of it. Most of it was just like getting the flow of, de you know, debugging sort of single single point failures, right? Like yeah. without having to run the entire build or yeah. test and wait twenty minutes and yeah, yeah. Then... I I very rarely run the full uh, end to end tests. It just takes a really long time. I don't think I actually do it ever. Um, what I might do is run subsets of tests inside my IDE, all the ones I care about, um, that kind of stuff. I'm just trying to see if there's any particular plugins that I, I really like. Um, yeah, we were chatting earlier about doing a pass over, optimizing the EDEs to make them go a little bit faster. Um, and this would certainly help with that, where you'd say, like, okay, this one I know is really slow. Let me just run that one over and over. Yeah. And Most of the time in the past, when I've looked at the Cloud Build YAML, it's about... In the past, what I've done is tried to find ways to run more things concurrently, because uh, we have an eight-core machine, which is quite nice. And so, if we can find ways to do that, um, yeah, I did notice when you run make, you run it with concurrency. Which yeah. I've not been doing. Oh yeah. So this is this is a thing that I really like for, especially for Agana, is where I'll say make dash j like that's that's my my standard build all the images. So build all four of them at the same time, or build yeah. build build. The steps in there's four things there's a bunch of stuff that gets built so like run four threads uh we have three images so push three of them up at the same time and then install um the uh if if you haven't run dash j if you haven't run it in make just says run in parallel um it's important this is important because if you do it without the end what it'll try to do is build the images and push them at the same time and funnily enough you can't push images that you haven't got yet so it, uh, so it does not do any dependency yeah so like parallelism. yeah so if you had push set up with the dependency of build images then yes you could do it just go like bash but we haven't done that because sometimes you want to push things and i don't know it's just a bit easier yeah, right. um but I've, i use that a lot uh also okay do you work on multiple machines if so do you have any scripts to set up new boxes and async your settings um so that's actually a really good question yes i do work on multiple machines because i work on my laptop and i work on my work machine the way we've set up this in here, the whole idea of how we set up is basically if you have make and you have Docker, everything should basically just work. Um, so if I don't have like that make shell, which you saw before, it will build the shell. Um, if the shell is changed because the Docker file has changed, then it'll rebuild automatically for everyone. So uh, that was that was the kind of thing that I, I believe in. I like that sort of setup quite nicely when, when building projects so that you, you know, it makes it easy. And then if I'm sharing code, then it's just Git. Like I just push stuff on down and it's fine. And that's what you'd mentioned before about having the minimal sort of local environment, right? Your minimal environment is two things. Yeah. Which is pretty minimal. It's pretty minimal. I can get away from stuff just because also I, I run Linux locally and I run Linux on the shell. So I can, yes. 
uh, some of the IDE settings, though, like our preferences you set in your IDE, which yeah. presumably you've had to set on the IDE in both places. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, so IntelliJ does, if you have your own account, um, so I actually I pay for IntelliJ and I have my own account, um, you can sync plugins. So I hear I've got it syncing silently. So you can sync plugins and IDE settings, um, which is super nice. Uh, it didn't, that, that didn't used to be around for a long time and you would have to like do exports and then imports and like stick it in Dropbox and then bring it back in and it's a pain. Um, and it's just, ugh. yeah, but now doing like sync plugins and, and settings and stuff is super, super nice. That makes me very happy. Okay. And you need an account for that, not just a license. If you have a, a, a can you create an account without paying for it? If you have a license, can you then use it? Or have no, it? I think it's my account is, is part of my, uh, where are we? I have it. Yeah. So I have it as a, as a registration and I'm registered under my JetBrains account. That um, might not be something everyone can take advantage of. No. Like, cause I have my license through Google right, yeah. through work. And so like, they don't give me my own account where I could yeah. set up that thinking. Yeah. I've been paying for it for a really long time. It's like 99 bucks a year to keep updating and I like what they do. So I'm very happy to give them money and I have the money. So it's fine. Sound very, I feel like it was way more expensive last time. I was, no. into it. It was a, I got a personal one for a long time ago. Technically, they give out licenses to people who do open source work, but I'm just very happy to support them. So very happy to do it. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, what other fun things are in here that I really like? Um, here's a fun one. So I really like uh, what's some common things I do. Search everywhere is super nice. Um, that also goes through like like actions as well. So I can search uh, classes, files, symbols, actions. So if I want to, um, one thing I will sometimes do is I'll actually use the IDE to commit or uh, edit a commit log because it has spell check and my um, <laughs> my bash shell doesn't. <laughs> Although I could probably change that too. Uh, so I might do that. But um, symbol search is also really nice. So for example, like we have a couple of flaky tests. Where are we? So like game server shutdown, I would just look usually everywhere and I can see that it comes up in symbols. And that'll take me there. Um, so I can do some nice stuff that way too, which I quite like inside the IDE. Um, other fun things. Oh, oh, you know what's also a fun one? Um, not only will it bring up documentation, which is nice. Um, if I, for example, get rid of that. And I'm like, oh, what? Oh, no, that's not going to work. Uh, if I want to, here we go, that's a good spot. So like, what should I put in here? I can bring up a, a pop-up that'll show me like the types of things I could pass in. Um, there are also options, I think it's what, control shift space or control space, um, where because it knows uh, what type of thing it should be, uh, it'll give me options to complete it. Um, but what's the thing I really like at the moment? Here we go. Uh, so if I'm, I'm just gonna do a thing cause it's gonna be easy. So let's say I'm going to create a game server just for an object's sake. Uh, view an offline game server. Boom. If I, I think it's alt enter on everything, but it's bring up inspections. The thing I really fun is like I can fill the struct from here. So I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, fill that struct for me. Thank you. Uh, maybe I might get rid of some stuff. Or I can also like fill struct recursively, which will go all the way down and give me default values. That's I find that that can be, especially when you start working with some big structs and Especially with like Kubernetes objects, which can go real deep. Yeah, that can be that can be a fun thing. That's nice. Yeah, that saves you from having to like go back and forth and look things up and piece yeah. them in one by one. I mean, it usually does a pretty good job of giving me code completion inside there, um, which I quite like. But uh, I found that's a that's a fun trick. There've definitely been a couple of times where I've had a struct, and it's hard to tell like. The, the levels of nesting until you get the part that you care about. Yeah. And you're like, I can't tell which one comes first. And there's, there's too many inter interleaved yep. pieces and like just to fill recursively would be pretty sweet for that. I mean, the other things, I mean, the refactoring support in here is just the thing that, that honestly just uh, keeps me inside IntelliJ. Um, you know, being able to do things like, Oh, where are we say so like, I don't like the way that's written as game servers. So let's call that foobar and it just changes it everywhere. Or gives me suggestions too. Oh, I don't like game servers. Maybe I call it something else. Um, I can pull things into methods. I can change method signatures and have it change across the whole thing. Um, 
by the way, I tried to do have IntelliJ do it when I was renaming the API types, and it just totally failed on me. But <laughs> dude, I did some of that by hand. So yeah, some of it see, works pretty well. Usually, some other ones. Um, Anthros has is like, do I have any snippets? Um, comes with a bunch. I mean, er I, error. Like that's a that's a pretty common one. I'll use that a lot. Um, I'm just trying to think. I have any other key bindings uh, that are particularly useful where we keep not key map uh, languages and frameworks where we it's live. You did say you had a lot of custom key bindings. Yeah. Also, kind of on the similar similar vein as the snippets, right? Or it's things that you've customized to make it faster for your particular workflow. I think also that I jumped around a bit at one point with a bunch of stuff, um, and so, so the, so the Go thing comes with a bunch of snippets. Actually, um, I think I use Error, and I don't think I actually use anything else. Uh, I definitely have seen oh Meth. That's an, that's one I write like Funk and Meth. I think I wrote both of those, where I have both the contents. So I it, it'll do. Um, so where it has the variable is the same name, uh, it'll put it in both spots. So this will be the so so that it so that my functions match what the preferred like the linter work wants. It'll be like the function name. Then I can write the 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 actual comment, and then I can write some parameters and some returns and ends. Um, I do do that a fair bit. Um, ooh, these are fun. Like if you need to do JSON, uh, the attributes at the end, it'll complete those for you as well, which are quite nice. Um, Interesting. Their their error snippet uh, is is promulgating the the wrong idiom though, because you should be trying to color your errors whenever you can. Uh, and if you do this, it's gonna like get you into the habit of putting. Lots of <laughs> yeah. Well, you start here and then you move on from there, <laughs> which is good. Uh, one thing it will also do is like test completion. I've definitely noticed. Um, so like if I'm doing game server, I don't know. It doesn't come up with anything. All right. Well, there's there. It'll it'll do. Um, I have seen it do te like um, if I write this as a test function, and that will do uh, something. Will give me any completion now. Apparently it won't. But if you uh, write the name of an object, and then it'll usually puts an underscore in front of it. But I don't know why, but it's nice. It'll give you all your public methods for that object and that stuff as well. Ah. <sighs> um, other fun things that I can't think of right now. I think that's probably all the things in my head, at least. All right. Well, maybe we'll start there. I think another good one of these to do would be to walk through cutting a release. That's something I was going to ask if you wanted to make yourself less of a bus factor on, and this might be a good format to do that. Yeah, I think I did one a while ago. Um... But some of the stuff's probably changed since then, so we could probably do that in the next release. Actually, I'll be in Japan in the next release, so that's that's probably a terrible yeah. idea. Um, <laughs> Maybe you'll get a different set of audio. You know, <laughs> people will be, be awake at different times. Yeah, it just depends on what the hotel Wi-Fi is like. Uh, some of that. The, some of that. So you've done it done it before. Where does that go? Does that go oh. push it to YouTube at some point? Yeah. I saw like one video on your Twitch channel. Yeah. So Twitch itself will keep uh, videos around, I think, for fourteen days. Uh, if you okay. go to um, actually in the bottom of the Twitch box, there's my YouTube thing, but it's it's slash Mark S Mandel. Okay. Um, but it's also in the Twitch stream links there. Um, and or yeah, Mark Mandel. Mark Mandel. Simon. Simon's my middle name. Um, I like Mandel better. Mandel. That's fine too. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I usually I'll end up checking it on YouTube, give it a quick edit to get rid of the beginning and end, and and it just like yeah. nothing nothing more special than that. But yeah, everything ends up on there eventually. Nice. So yeah, cool. I don't know if you're gonna get kicked out of your room. I'm just at home, so I can stay here for as long as I like. Uh, I'm camping in this room. It's worked pretty well. Day, so. <laughs> Nobody's kicked me out yet. Cool. Uh, but we probably should wrap it up and, and keep the video relatively short and, and concise so we don't ramble on forever. That uh, works. All right. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining me on this Twitch stream. Yeah, thanks. This, I think this worked out well because you're not just teaching me. Now you're able to teach other people, <laughs> and, and it's been, been good having a little bit of uh, interactivity also from the chat room. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening and watching as well. And uh, yeah, follow me on Twitter at Neurotic. Follow me on uh, Twitch at Mark Mandel and YouTube at Mark S Mandel. Uh, Robert, I, I mentioned you on Twitter. Did you? Uh, do you want to tweet your mention your uh, Twitter goodness. things? I, I I think I tweeted maybe once. Uh, <laughs> I went to, I went to a, a Kelsey Hightower how to use Twitter session, 
uh, where he forced me to tweet, and then I'm not sure I've tweeted much since then. Uh, but I, maybe I'll get back into it. I found you. I think, it, I, I think it's. I think it's the same as my GitHub. I found you on Twitter. Maybe. You are uh, remarkably clean shaven at Robert H Bailey. I think is that the same. I think it's the same picture I have on GitHub. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is. And I think my son was six months old, and now he is seven. So it's, uh, <laughs> oh, boy. the picture is a bit dated. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. We all appreciate ourselves a bit younger. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, yeah. Like I said, thank you so much. Um, and I'll probably see you in Slack in about five minutes. That's right. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. All right, see ya. <laughs>